In the book of Kings, uh, 1 Kings, around 18, 19, chapters 18 and 19, he had just gotten done with that, uh, that great ordeal there on Mount Carmel where uh, he had called the prophets of Baal together and they had that contest on uh, who could pray down fire from heaven from their gods. And of course, uh, the prophets of Baal, they prayed and prayed and yelled and carried on and danced and cut themselves in order to try to please their gods and send fire down from heaven to consume the, the sacrifice, and it never happened. And so it came Elijah's turn to pray. And he builds this altar, and he puts the sacrifice on it, the, the, the sticks, and then the, the sacrifice, and then he prays. And he calls on God to send fire down to consume the sacrifice. And fire came down. That's an awesome story. Especially if you really look into it and find out other things that he did. And uh, maybe someday we'll preach on that. But um, anyhow, he he had that that ordeal with them. And then uh, he told the king, the wicked king Ahab, that he better get back to the palace because it was going to rain. And of course it hadn't rained for seven years and there was a drought and they were all mad at Elijah anyhow because he was the one that said that they were going to have this drought. And so he told the king to get back. And uh, before that, all, he had all the prophets of Baal put to death. Okay, they had all died, put to death. And then he got word that Jezebel was after his life. And Jezebel said, before the night comes, you will be dead. And what happens to Elijah? He does a nose spin. He he was just on the mountaintop. Everything was going great. God was awesome. Everything was wonderful. And he now does a nose spin because he realizes that Jezebel is after his life. And he flees. He runs. And then he starts to complain. And he tells God, I am the only one left. Why are you doing this to me? I want to speak to you this morning on lost focus. On lost focus. Elijah lost his focus. And when he lost his focus... His way became very, very confusing. You know, the enemy is wanting us to lose our focus, to get sidetracked. And he will do everything in his power to make us lose focus. Get us to be sidetracked so we can't see the power and the glory And the awesomeness of God. How does one lose their focus? How does one lose their focus? Well, I I, I jotted down several, several reasons. Well, when church attendance becomes an act of convenience instead of a discipline, we lose our focus. We lose our focus when church attendance becomes an act of convenience instead of a discipline. Hey, I want to tell you something, church. If you haven't found this out by yet, something you should have learned a long time ago, and that is that Christianity is a discipline. It's not a convenience. We're not Christians because it's convenient to be a Christian doesn't work like that. Christianity is certainly an awesome experience. It's a walk with God. It's an experience with God, but it is also a discipline. And when church attendance becomes, you know, I'll go to church when it's convenient. I'll go to church when I don't have anything else to do. It becomes a convenience. 
when it really needs to be a discipline. And I shared with you last week in, my, in, in, in the sermon I preached, Hebrews 10.25, it says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching Okay, one loses their focus when Bible reading and prayer life becomes an act of convenience instead of a discipline. Hey, if your devotional time <coughs> is, is like, hey, I'll read my Bible, I'll have my prayer time when I get around to it, when it's convenient to do it, You're not doing, you're not going very far. Your focus is being switched and changed. Our Bible time, our Bible reading, and our devotional time, and and, and our prayer time, our time spent with God needs to be a disciplined time. And the best way to do that is pick out a part of the day and say, this is God's time. Whether it's early in the morning, or whether if you're a night owl and you're, you're more awake and you're better in the evening, then, then that should be your time. I don't, I don't know when it might be. Maybe, maybe it's better for you in the afternoon. I, I don't know, and that doesn't matter. The point is that you are disciplined with your Bible reading and your prayer time, and, and you've got a time that it's set aside for you and God. If not, you're going to miss having your time with God more than you will have your time with God if it's just a convenient time, if you look for just when it's convenient. We lose our focus when the joy of serving becomes an act of convenience instead of a discipline. When the act of serving becomes a time of convenience instead of a discipline. You know, God has given all of us spiritual gifts and we need to use those gifts for his honor and for his glory and we need to be joyful about it carl proctor lynn's brother always had a joke i really can't remember any of his jokes that he shared he'd he'd walk in the office and he had more jokes than, than a joke book would have. I mean, he could just rattle off these jokes. And uh, sometimes I had to scratch my head. I, I, I couldn't quite get them all. But, but anyhow, that was, that was Carl. Okay, and if you knew Carl, you know exactly what, what I mean. He, he, although he did have some good ones. But he taught me something that, that I'll never forget. One day we were out building my barn out on my property. And... Uh, Actually, it was more than once he said this. That's why I can still remember it, I guess. Uh, I, I, I thanked him for, for his help. And, and really, I was, I was grateful for the fact that he had just come out and just, just helped me. And we had some great fellowship together. But often he would say this when he left after I thanked him. He would say, no, thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. For the opportunity to serve. I'd scratch my head over that one. I'd say, wow, he's thanking me for helping me to serve. And I thought, you know, that's, that's what true Christianity is really all about, isn't it? The joy of serving. The joy of, of helping others. Serving others. That's, that's what it's about. And you know, when, when life becomes all about me, we end up losing our focus of what it really is all about. Life is not about you. It's about Him. And we need to be thinking about this. If we say that, hey, I don't have time to serve, something's wrong. If we say, hey, I'll help you when I have convenient, when it's convenient for me to help you. I'll teach a class when I've got the time. I'll do this when I've got the time, when it's convenient. Something's wrong. 
our focus isn't where it ought to be. The joy of service. There is joy. Now I realize it has to become a discipline. And be honest with you, none of us really like a whole lot of discipline in our lives. It's easier to just say, you know, do it when I get the time. When it's convenient. But you know, by living like that, our focus gets all out of whack. It needs to be discipline. It needs to be discipline. So the next time somebody comes and says, hey, can you help me do this? Or can you help me do that? Be willing. Yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. Because there's joy in serving. And God will bless you for it. When we give to God, when it's convenient, instead of practicing and disciplining ourselves in the area of stewardship, we lose our focus. We lose our focus. And the whole area of stewardship, and stewardship is not just about money, although that is certainly an important aspect of it all. That's not really what I want to focus on tonight, today. It's this whole concept of stewardship, your time, your talent, and certainly your finances. Are you disciplined? Are you honoring God? You know, if we're not disciplined in our stewardship, we're losing our focus. We're losing our focus. How much time do you give God? In your week, how much time? You say, well, Pastor, I go to church every Sunday. Oh, that's great. That's great. It's a good thing to do. Good habit to get into. It's a good discipline. But what about the rest of the week? How much time are you giving God? Spending time praying? Spending time in His Word? Are you sharing your faith? Are you helping others? You're trying to be a blessing to someone else. All of that is a part of, of stewardship. Life is not about you. It's about Him. When life becomes a drudgery instead of a time of learning and growing, we're losing our focus. Last week I called a pastor, cousin, friend who's going through a bout with cancer. And uh, Randy and I, we, best of friends, went to school together, um, had some great times together. We roomed together. Uh, we, were, we were best of friends. Ministries have taken us in two different directions. He pastors more on, on the western side of, or the eastern side of the state. And of course, I'm here on the western side of the state, and we don't get together much, don't see each other much. But from time to time, we call each other. He's been battling cancer for, I don't know, probably two years now. I called him the other day and said, Randy, how, how's it going? He said, I oh, said, you know, he said, God is so good. He said, I, I went for a, a CAT scan the other day, though, and they, they saw a spot in the back of my stomach that uh, they can't get to, and they're trying to treat it through chemo. And he said, you know, he said, the, the chemo, this, this set of, of chemo treatments are, it's pretty powerful stuff, and he said, it, it makes me break out in hives, and he said, uh, the sunlight makes it worse, and I itch all the time, and he said, my, my body gets a bit distorted, and he said that uh, when, when I take this chemo, he said, I, I can't sleep for several days. He said, I'm awake. He said, day and night. He said, I just, I just can't sleep. He said, I just walk the house back and forth. But he said, after a few days, he said, I crash, and he said, but then I, I sleep for a couple of days. And he said, it's kind of rough on, on ministry, but he said, you know, he said, God 
is so good. And he said, I, I, I have learned so many lessons through all of this. And he said, you know, he told me, he told me a couple months ago, he said, you know, I, I, I wouldn't trade this experience for anything. He said, I don't particularly care for it. Don't like it. But he said, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. I thought, wow, what an attitude, what an attitude. You know, we may not know the outcome of what sickness or, or what the future may hold, but one thing we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and that is who holds us in the palm of his hand. He holds us. And when he's holding us, he gives us grace. He gives us strength. He gives us everything that we have need of. Attitude is everything. How's your attitude? You know, in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 8, it says this. Your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Your attitude ought to be the same as Christ. Wow. Think about that for a moment. Hey, now I'm sure everybody can say, Pastor, I've got the attitude of Christ this morning. That's easy to do when you're sitting in church. How was your attitude throughout this past week? Who'd you get mad at? Who'd you yell at? Who'd you scream at? Who'd you fight with? Pastor, you don't know that person I have to live with. <laughs> Maybe not. But hey, did you have the attitude of Jesus Christ? That's what the Word's saying. We should have the same attitude as that of Christ. Do we? Something to think about. When we allow fear to consume us, instead of giving it to God, our focus is changing. We're not focused on the right thing. It tells us in 1 Kings 19 verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Elijah was afraid and he ran. How many people run? Because of fear. How many people run? How many people throw up their hands and say, hey, I quit. I've had enough. Because of fear. How many people give in? You know, the devil wants to make us afraid. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Word of God says that He gives us the power to overcome. To overcome temptation. To overcome our fears. To overcome that which may come our way. He gives to us the power. So why do we need to fear? Well, what do we do? What do we do when we have changed or lost our focus or we've lost our way? How do we get back on track? Well, number one, we have to change our focus. We have to change our focus, and that's what Elijah certainly had to do. God told Elijah, go to the mountain. Go to the mountain. And he went to the mountain inside of a cave, and as he, he stood at, the, at the, the opening of the cave, he looked out over the land, and he saw an earthquake. And the Bible says God wasn't in the earthquake. He saw a rushing mighty wind and God wasn't in the wind. He saw fire and God wasn't in the fire. But then it tells us he heard a still, small voice. He heard a still, small voice. You know what the problem with many of us is in our life? We're too busy. We're too busy. 
And many of us are too busy doing nothing to hear the still small voice of God. Hey, put down the magazines and put down the books and put down the newspapers and turn off the TV and shut off the radio and listen to quietness. Because in the quietness, you might just hear the still small voice of the Almighty speaking to your heart. Take the time to listen. He wants to change your focus. He wants to change your focus. How else do we change our focus? Well, we change our focus by focusing on good things. By focusing on good things. In, in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 8, it says this. Paul is, is writing and he, and he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does he say? Think. Think about such things. What's he saying? He's saying change your focus. Get thinking about good things. Get thinking about wholesome things. Get thinking about godly things. Get thinking about things that are right. Instead of always the negative and the bad and the discouraging things. Change your focus. Think on good things. Get your eyes on God instead of yourself. We need to get away to refocus. Get away to refocus. Take a spiritual vacation. You know, even Jesus needed to take a spiritual vacation. He had to get away. He had to go to the mountain to pray, to be alone with God. And that's exactly what we need to do. Seek the still small voice of God. God has something He wants to say to you. Stand on the promises of God. Get into the Word of God and tell God, ask God to give you a promise to stand on. Hey, we are all going through tough times. Some more than others. I understand that. But that's why we need to get into the Word of God and we need to say, God, I need something that I can stand on. I need something that I can hold on. My future is so uncertain. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But God, give me a word from, from your book that I can stand on and I can hold on to, that I can go to that will comfort me. You know, God doesn't want to hang you out there to dry. God wants to hold you in the palm of His hand. God wants to put His loving arms around you. And squeeze you tight. And God can do that if you take the time to look into the Word and ask and ask, tell Him to give you a promise. And He wants to encourage you. He wants to give you something. Find a spiritual friend that can listen to you and give you some wise encouragement. Hey, we all need times where we need to unload. We need to talk to someone that can help us and, and give us perhaps a different perspective. You know, the enemy fights. We need, to, we, we need to stop listening to his voice and listen to God's voice and listen to a voice of, of a spiritual person that we have the utmost confidence in, that we know is walking close to God and has a genuine experience with God. Because it, are, it, are, it is those people that will encourage us and help us. And be honest with us. Focus on something else other than your problem. There is always someone out there that is worse off than you are. I thought about this the other day when Hannah said in the children's hospital as they spent a couple of days and nights there. She said, you know, she said, I was there with, with Liam and we were dealing with what we were dealing with. But she said, I, I could hear the other children. 
in the other rooms just crying all night long. And she said, knowing that my son came through surgery okay and he was progressing well, she said, my heart just broke as I, as I listened and knowing what some of these other parents were going through. And she said it was so sad. So sad. You know, we need to get our eyes off of our problems and, and off of ourselves. Because I'll tell you what, there is always somebody out there that is worse off than you are. And that's not to say that, you know, we don't have our problems. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we, we need to, to, to refocus and, and just, you, you know, life is not just about me and my problems. Last of all, we need to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. The Word of God says in everything, give thanks. Start by praising God for the blessings that you do have. Start by praising God for the blessings that you do have. You know, the, the hymn writer wrote, Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. In spite of, of what we're dealing with in our lives right now, God still has blessed us. And we need to begin by praising God, thanking Him, for the blessings that we do have. Start by doing that. And it will certainly help you to get refocused on what's really important. Will you stand with me, please? Dear Lord, we come before you this morning realizing that there are times in all of our lives that we face things that we don't have an explanation for. We don't know why sometimes we go through the things that we do. We don't know why we have to deal always with the struggles and the battles that we deal with. But Father, we know that you have a purpose for everything that happens. We may not always understand that. In fact, sometimes it seems like most of the times we don't understand it. But Lord, we believe that you are a loving Heavenly Father. We believe that you have our best interest at heart. We believe you have our picture on your refrigerator. And we believe that you love us like no one else could possibly love us. And so, Father, for whatever your people are going through this morning, I pray that you would help us to just allow your Spirit to put your loving arms around us and pull us close. Help us to listen to the still, small voice of our Heavenly Father. Speak to our hearts. Accomplish in our lives through the battles and the struggles and the things that we face, the very things that you want to accomplish through us. Help us to learn, help us to grow, and help us to be a blessing to others through all the battles we go through. And Father, because you give us the grace and the strength, we'll be sure to give you all the praise and the glory. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed, and may God bless you.